Welcome. My name is Holly. I'm a program manager here at Edison Ford Winter Estates. And each month I do these digital discussions. And thank you for joining me. I'm in front of the 20th Main at Gettysburg. I'm going to move myself back a little bit so you can see Jeff Daniels there as Joshua Chamberlain. And to his left, the guy turned to the left with the sideburns. Uh, that is his brother, Tom, who's adjutant at Gettysburg. And I thank you for being here. And we're gonna get started by sharing the screen and then I'll tell you a little more about Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, how, why am I interested in him? And this isn't about me, but I'll just give you a little bit of background. I was at Gettysburg in the early nineties to mid nineties. And I heard the story of Chamberlain and I probably had heard it before, but I had never really taken in his story. And I discovered that his home was only two hours away. So I also uh, went to visit there and eventually became a docent and they are only open about half the year and I would drive back and forth and give tours and developed a great interest in Chamberlain and his story and tracing his steps and reading and researching about him. So with that being said, let's uh, talk about Joshua Chamberlain and American Civil War. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was born Lawrence Joshua Chamberlain, September 8th, 1828 in Brewer, Maine. The oldest of five children born to Joshua and Sarah Brasto Chamberlain. And he always, uh, at college, once he goes to Bowdoin, he goes by Joshua Lawrence instead of Lawrence Joshua. And he's named after the famous uh, sea captain, Captain James Lawrence and his favorite famous for this quote, don't give up the ship during the War of 1812. And this, and where he's born, Brewer, Maine is a sister city to a bigger city you've probably heard of called Bangor. And uh, this is where he was born, 315 North Main Street, and this is where he grew up. And that's on Chamberlain Street. As a young man, Joshua briefly attended Major Whiting's Academy. He worked on the family farm and he taught himself and was taught in the local schools. And as a young man, he stuttered when he was speaking with words that began with P, B, and T. And he taught himself this, this rhythmic, I call it a sing song type message. And this is him as a young man here at Bowdoin College. His father wanted him to attend West Point and, and his mother wanted to become a minister. And here's his dad over here. And he looks like a no nonsense type of New Englander and having grown up in New England and this, he especially grew up on closer to the middle of the state. Uh, I think his father's word was law. There's one time there's a story about he gets a wagon, you know, they're farming, gets a wagon wheel stuck in, in some rocks and ruts and his and he said, what should I do? And his father said, fix it, that's how. So I just have that sense that it was pretty no nonsense. Maybe Joshua is a little closer to his mother here. So his father wants him to go to West Point and his mother wants to become a minister. And at that time, he wasn't interested in pursuing either. He wants to attend Bowdoin College, which is a, a quite a well-known academic institution and quite prestigious. And he made himself a room in his parents' attic in Brewer, Maine, and he teaches himself Greek and Latin with the help um, of a tutor. So he become he become admitted to Bowdoin College, and he's actually admitted uh, mid year eighteen forty eight, uh, which was highly unusual. And look at the languages he had to learn. So this is the time period; it wasn't modern languages. He meets, uh, by the way, I am going to get to the Civil War. I just, I'm kind of setting the table and then we'll get into the main course of Civil War and then we will wrap it up, uh, cleaning things up about the, his later years. But this is to kind of give you the idea of what kind of man he was. He met Francis Carolyn Adams who played the organ when he was the conductor of the choir at the First Parish Church in Brunswick. And this is right near the campus of, there's the, um, 
the church and just down the street here is the campus of Bowdoin College where he attended and then over here to the way off the screen over to the right would be his home uh, when he's married and has a family. As she is and his wife Frances known as Fanny was raised as a daughter of the church's pastor Reverend George Adams. She was born in Boston to Asher and Amelia Willis Adams and supposedly she was a descendant of the Adams from the Quincy area. I uh, have never researched that to see if it was true. Uh, Asher, her father was, this is the third time he's been married. I'm assuming he was widowed twice before, but he's old enough to be her grandfather. This is the excuse that was given and it was decided she should live with her cousin who was much older than her, George and his wife, Sarah, at a very early age because it was difficult for her father because of his age. Remember, this is a different time period here. And they began a courtship while he was a student at Bowdoin College. Uh, Fanny and Joshua attended a literary discussion group at the home of his professor, Calvin Stowe. Stowe's wife, Harriet Beecher Stowe, read aloud chapters that she had just completed of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And she was writing in its serial form for an abolitionist newspaper. On March 2nd, 1851, during a communion service at the First Parish Church in Brunswick, and I've, I've told this story when I was telling her story, she had a vision of a slave being whipped to death. And Harriet went home after the service and wrote what she had seen. Chamberlain, a Bowdoin student at the time, report, recalled Saturday evenings at the Stowe's home when friends of the family would gather to hear Harriet read from drafts of Uncle Tom's Cabin. So as was basically a literary discussion group, the readings remembered Chamberlain were followed by frank discussion, giving Harriet an opportunity to gauge audience reactions. Um, Harriet was actually there a little longer than her husband because he was going back and forth to another uh, college professorship that he had. And they are only gonna live there in Bowdoin for two years. And by the way, when she's there, she does also participate in the Underground Railroad by hiding an enslaved person. And so there's Harriet Beecher Stowe, and there's her, their home that they lived in. I think it has green shutters today. And also, well, I'll get to that. Um, that's gonna be coming up, so I won't skip ahead. In 1852, Fanny traveled with Professor George Root, a musician and brother to Fanny's stepmother, to New York to continue her music education. And I'll be quite honest, her adoptive or foster mother, I was never quite sure which she was, had passed away and her father had married someone about the same age as her and that she felt a lot of tension in the home. Uh, that it just wasn't working out, she missed her mother. And this is the chapel at Bowdoin College. Uh, so she, she, then she taught voice at a school for girls in Milledgeville, Georgia, while Chamberlain attended Bangor Theological Seminary. She also gave private piano lessons and played organ at the Presbyterian Church. The Adams valued art and music and Fanny was accomplished in both. From her childhood, she suffered from pain in her eyes and later in life, she would become completely blind. After graduation, Chamberlain became an instructor at Bowdoin teaching rhetoric, then became a professor of theology and later modern languages and Joshua and Fanny were married on December 7th, 1855. So they are separated for about three years. That's a hard way to carry on a romance. And I don't think that I did mention this. So I will just tell you that if you visit the First Parish Church today, you can see a pew dedicated to Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, and one also that was done much later to Joshua Chamberlain. And I might as well uh, tell you right now, before I forget to tell you that this saying is that Brunswick, Maine is where the Civil War began and ended. It began there because Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And supposedly Lincoln gives credit to her by saying, you're the little lady that started this great war. And it ends because Joshua Chamberlain will receive the surrender of the Confederate troops, the formal surrender ceremony. Yes, it's a bit of a stretch, but it's uh, a kind of a cool connection to have. Joshua and Fanny had children. They had five, actually, two survived to adulthood, three die in infancy. Uh, 
four of the children, the, uh, the two that girls that died quite young, uh, have a grave at the, um, in the cemetery and as well as his two children that lived through adulthood. The little boy that they had that died very, very young and very early, uh, I'm not sure where he's buried. She, um, they have a daughter, Grace Dupee Chamberlain and Joshua called her Daisy. She's very close to her father. And I put 1956, I believe that was 1856 and she will marry and have three daughters. And in 1858, Harold Willis Chamberlain was born uh, and that's, he's known as Willis. They bought the house in 1859 where they had rented for two years. In the 1830s, before Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain purchased it, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow boarded in three rooms with his wife. And this is the house, the way it would have looked when it was just down the feet, a few feet down the road on what's actually Potter Street. When you look at this, um, it is uh, facing Main Street. And this site might actually be facing Main Street as well, but it's originally on Potter Street. And then they move it to face Main Street, but around the corner here is still Potter Street. And there's more things that'll happen to the home that I'll mention on a little, a little bit. Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow is gonna come back and visit Chamberlain. And I tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. And this is some of Joshua Chamberlain's family. As I said, we're setting the table. Um, this is his brother, Horace. Joshua's the oldest. His sister, Sarah, who's very close to, his brother, John, his brother, Tom, who will be at Gettysburg with him. And actually his brother, John, will be as well. His son, uh, Harold Willis Chamberlain, and he will never marry or have children. He's very close to his mother and will stay at home uh, near her quite a bit. And his daughter, Daisy, I showed her as a young woman. There's a picture of him that looks very similar to this one because young children were frequently dressed that way, whether they were uh, male or female during the time period, but I chose to put a picture of here, him here as an adult. In 1861, he was appointed uh, the chairman of modern languages of Europe which have provided the opportunity to a two paid, paid two year sabbatical to travel and study abroad and lifetime tenure, what more could you want? But the outbreak of war, and by the way, Chamberlain uh, knows something like nine languages. He goes from being a pre, um, instructor of rhetoric. So he's a good public speaker, um, briefly to pre, uh, theology and then to this job. But the outbreak of war weighed heavily upon Chamberlain who desperately wanted to serve his company, country. Over the objections of the college, Chamberlain offers his services to the governor of Maine, Israel Washburn, who appoints him Lieutenant Colonel of the newly formed 20th Maine. And actually he is initially offered a colonelcy. During the Civil War, you didn't necessarily have to have, necessarily have to have any experience. They have a volunteer army as well as the regular army, but he didn't feel he was qualified. So he's gonna be the Lieutenant Colonel of this organization. And the college was not officially affiliated with the Congregational Church, which was much more conservative at that time, but loosely affiliated. And they really tried to undermine Chamberlain going to war, writing things to the governor. Uh, they didn't want him to leave, but he's going to. He was 33 and the 20th Maine, by the way, was part of the 3rd Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Corps. And he's gonna take advantage of his position as second in command and studied every military work I can find under the tutelage of his commander, West Point graduate, Adelbert Ames, who had already won a Medal of Honor with another main organization. And the main, the main people are made up mostly from the center of the state, but not one specific region like some of the other regiments before were done. They trained in Portland at Camp Mason for eight weeks and were present on September 17th, 1862 at the Battle of Antietam. Though the fifth corps was held in reserve. And I remember a story, this is um, from my brain. So uh, if I'm a little, off of something about him seeing 
a young dead Southern soldier sitting under a tree. There was a little testament in his pocket and Chamberlain writes eloquently about seeing that young man that was supposed to be his enemy, but didn't feel like his enemy. And I believe he found a signature in it and somehow gets that little testament back to his family. Their first major engagement was at Fredericksburg, which is more unusual that battle is hold, held in the winter um, at Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, the regiment lost four men killed and 32 wounded, charging Marie's Heights later in the day. Uh, now the Confederates had the high ground behind a stone wall. That's a very precarious position. And, and they spent the next day and two nights laying out in the open the front of Confederate positions, they realize that they are right near the, the enemy is on the other side of that stone wall. And one night Chamberlain's going to write about um, like basically hiding himself by a dead body under part of the overcoat to protect him. And hearing this, he's quite um, Victorian in his language, but he'll write about hearing this shutter squeak saying never forever never forever uh some of his writings that come out a lot of them other than official reports is some that are written for magazines so there was a lot of editing done by them some of his memories are written right away some much later so there could be a slight variations but serving as a rear guard the 20th maine was the, one of the last regiments back across the rappahannock um, and they, you know, if you actually go um, visit Fredericksburg, of the battle, a lot of the battle wound through the town where they end up at Marie Heights, and you're going to see how difficult a position it was for the Union. I encourage you to go visit some of these battlefields, hear the story, do as much reading as you can when you're there, maybe even read before. So there's Chamberlain. And he, uh, he conducted himself quite admirably, I believe, at that battle. And this is a Civil War print uh, of Joshua Chamberlain. My husband uh, had bought, this is probably the last print I had. Many of them were many years before, but this one he bought me um, as a smaller one of Chamberlain. Colonel Chamberlain print by John Paul Strain. The 20th Maine missed the Battle of Chancellorsville due to being quarantined. They were actually given a faulty uh, smallpox inoculation and a number of the men contracted smallpox. Chamberlain himself doesn't have it. Lieutenant Colonel Chamberlain pleaded with Brigadier General Dan Bill Butterfield to put the men into the fight and was refused. Chamberlain said, if we couldn't do anything else, we could give the rebels the smallpox. Instead, the they were assigned to guard duty, the rest of them on the telegraph line from headquarters to the, to the United States Ford. Although Chamberlain joined the first division for the fight and had another horse shot out from other, under him. He actually has five horses. He leaves with a horse named Prince um, as a gift from the people of Brunswick and he'll eventually acquire other horses. And I'll talk about the last one he has uh, later on. There were 84 cases of smallpox and three deaths due to the faulty smallpox inoculation. And by the way, uh, Colonel Ames got himself attached elsewhere so that he wasn't stuck quarantined with the men. And on May 20th, 1863, Colonel Ames was promoted to Brigadier General and given command of a brigade in the 11th Corps. And Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Chamberlain was promoted to Colonel and took command of the regiment. The 20th was reduced to roughly about 400 men from their initial 1,100. Most regiments um, started out initially with about 1,000 men. And if you have any questions or chat or anything, uh, I will answer it all at the end of the presentation. A union um, on the second, though here we are on the second day of the Gat Battle of Gettysburg. Um, there's supposed to be a union line shaped in reverse uh, fish hook. Somebody wasn't happy with their uh, position. That's uh, Dan Sickles who moves his uh, regiment forward. 
and people, there's a gap in the union line and people are uh, able to pour themselves in that gap and they're gonna get in the near places that the union doesn't want them to be. Uh, the union, so on the second day is sent to assess the situation on Little Round Top. And I think back then it was either called one of the round tops or that rocky little hill over there. Later on, there's gonna, they'll be called big and little round top, there's two. And this man right here, his union engineer, his name is Governor Warren. He stands on a rocket little round top. And if you walk up to look at it, you're looking at the back of him. But if, you, um, if you're down in Devil's Den or you down below that looking up, you can see Governor Warren. He is assessing the situation on Little Round Top and he sees that there's only signalmen placed there. And he re requests that Union troops be there. So somebody is set out to request that they be placed there. And the person that he's looking for, and of course my mind's drawing a blank, is not available, but he runs into Colonel Strong Vincent who had brought his four regiments to the area. He's a brigade commander among them, by the way, was the 83rd Pennsylvania where he got his start. And he volunteers for this duty to place troops on Little Round Top because with that gap, we have the troops going to look at that. Some of them were already on Big Round Top, but they see that that is a better, more strategic location. And they're starting to pour in there. 20th, Chamberlain's 20th Maine is under Strong Vincent at that point and was ordered to defend the left flank of the Union line. And Vincent is going to tell him something like, hold that ground at all hazards. And this is a chain, I own this print. And this is uh, called A Hard Day for Mother. And this is them. They're going to get off their horses when they actually ascend Little Round Top. But this was not unusual to find people on horses with gunfire coming in at them. And this is Joshua Chamberlain here on his horse. This is his brother, John. He is there with the Christian Commission. They are there to take care of the physical and spiritual needs of the wounded. And this is his brother, Tom. Tom Chamberlain is the only young man who does uh, of the family who does not go to college. He's there at Gettysburg is his brother, adjutant and lieutenant. And if you watch the movie Gettysburg, you'll see him to say, don't call me Lawrence. I, I think there was a little poetic license from that. And trust me, I think the movie Gettysburg is wonderful. Um, and it's actually based on an amazing book called Killer Angels. It's a historic fiction. I highly recommend you read it. It wins the Pulitzer Prize. So Joshua said it's a hard day for mother because her three boys are together. They're at the Battle of Gettysburg and they could get shot quite easily. So John is sent to the rear um, front to prepare for the wounded. And Tom is sent to bring up the stragglers at the Battle of Gettysburg. And you can see what's happening at the back in the background there. Here we have Colonel Strong Vincent's uh, monument to him on a very rocky, difficult area to get through, a lot of overgrowth. And this is a monument to Colonel Strong Vincent. This here says wounded July 2nd. And he died July 7th, 1863. And this is supposed to represent Colonel Vincent who was in charge of numerous brigades. And this is um, the 83rd Pennsylvania and it's supposed to be an anonymous soldier, but it's actually Strong Vincent. His home is in Erie, Pennsylvania. I believe they have a statue to them here. And um, I, a highly underrated, a very brave man just goes forward and a bullet struck, strikes him fatally. Reportedly, his last command was don't give an inch, don't give an inch up of ground, hold this ground. So this is supposed to not be him, it's supposed to be a 83rd Pennsylvanian, but it's definitely strong Vincent. I don't, um, he has heavy sideburns that go down into a beard, but not a beard with a mustache on it. 
It's very difficult to get to this monument, by the way, but it's worth it to pay your respects. Lions of the Round Top by Don Triani. Yes, you guessed it. I have this print. This is my very favorite of all the ones I have. I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, but the extreme left of the Union Army was held by the 20th Maine Volunteer Infantry who brought about 386 men to Gettysburg. Of those men, 29 were killed, 91 are wounded and five were missing. And the names of the casualties are written on the monument on Little Round Top, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, if they give way, the Union would have been outflanked. Some people believe that they still would have ended up okay. I don't happen to agree with that view. Uh, outflanking, going around them and getting that high ground, controlling it. Opposing them were the nearly 650 Confederates of the 47th and the 15th Alabama, um, overseen by Colonel William C. Oates. And when his men ran low on ammunition, Chamberlain orders a bayonet charge. Now I want to tell you that they're originally in a straight line and they actually kind of do a walk. They extend their line and bend it back. They refuse the line to offer more protection on both sides so they don't have people going around them. I am leaving a ton of information out there. Um, he orders a bayonet charge. They are low on ammunition. The same time, Colonel William Oates, who has men that have marched a lot, they ended up on big round top and now they're here. They didn't have any water. He had sent out his uh, men to water bearers. They are captured. So they're charging uphill without any water. So supposedly they are also now running on low on ammunition and they might've been deciding to retreat but no matter what, we know that Chamberlain orders a bayonet charge. It breaks up the flanking attempt by the 15th and drove them back to where Company B of the 20th Maine and members of the US uh, sharpshooters were concealed behind a stone wall. They open fire. That is also contributes heavily to the Alabamans um, retreat. They're quite taken by surprise. Uh, today, there's nothing in history that is without controversy. Um, Joshua Chamberlain uh, submits a report. Um, many, many years later, after not challenging it, uh, somebody he was very close to, Captain Ellis Spear, challenges that Chamberlain didn't order the bayonet charge, that Holman Melcher right here ordered it. But the thing I believe that Chamberlain is going to always Right now, I'll tell you what's happening here, but he's always going to lead his men. Did he actually say the word bayonet? I can tell you. Did other people join in that charge down Little Round Top? Absolutely. There's the colors of the 20th Maine. There's Joshua Chamberlain. There is a Lieutenant Wicker. Joshua, he is trying to shoot a Chamberlain. His gun misfires. Chamberlain holds him at bayonet point and takes his revolver from him and he surrenders. And many of the Alabama soldiers retreat. Some are captured, um, some die. Joshua Chamberlain has his brother John there. I mentioned that he survives the battle. Colonel William C. Oates, he has his younger brother John there. Um, he is shot at the Battle of Gettysburg and dies several days later. And eventually both Chamberlain and Oates will become governors. Oates becomes the governor of Alabama, Chamberlain the governor of Maine. There is a monument to the 20th Maine um, infantry there. There is not one to the Alabamans. Um, when they tried that many years later, they couldn't agree, Chamberlain and Oates could not agree on where it should be placed. There is a plethora more of information about this. Nothing is exactly as you would think it would be, but the general you get the general idea of what happened here. I own this, this is very uh, precious one to me. 
Uh, the best regimental history that was ever written, in my opinion, was written by a man named John Poulin, an advertising executive, but he's, the 20th Maine didn't have um, a regimental history. So a lot um, that was common that maybe 30 years or so after somebody from the regiment, the historian, sometimes earlier, write the story. Well, that didn't happen, but John Pullen, so it's not written by as somebody that was there, but he gathered together all this information. Eventually he will live in Brunswick and he writes the story of the 20th Maine. And I think that came out about 1959. I urge you to read it, their story. Eventually that story, some things are uh, challenged um, and expanded upon and whether or not I completely agree to it. Uh, there's another book that follows up on um, Poland's story called Stand Firm, You Boys from Maine, uh, written by Tom Desjardins. There's, so there's a lot of material out there about the 20th Maine and of course, a lot of material about Chamberlain. And anyways, what I was gonna tell you was that John Poulin, they're auctioning off this historic print and they, they have artist proofs, AP um, proofs, and they have historic print proof, a HPP. And they were selling tickets for them at the Chamberlain Museum for this print. And I'm with my children who I take to every historic place imaginable when they're teenagers. And I bought one ticket and I won this print and it was, um, pulled out by John Poulin who wrote the book, the book about the 20th Maine. And so I have it hanging in my house. The story, um, the, the Joshua Chamberlain Museum has the first one that Don Troiani draws about this called Bayonets. And uh, he improved on it, felt it was a more accurate perhaps view. He has Melcher a little bit down further. We're never gonna know exactly who was where, but you get the idea. Idea, I sound like. Is a 20th main monument. Um, you can see the goofy gal here. That's me sitting in front of it. I've probably visited Gettysburg close to 15 times. This is their monument. There's a small parking lot down here. Sturt has like four positions way over here where they're redoing and they're going to close down soon. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of little round top. You can walk through the woods that way. There's a left and right flank marker. There's a 20th Main Monument. And there's a monument to Company B that were with the sharpshooters there. Colonel Chamberlain and Sergeant Andrew Tozier awarded the Medal of Honor for their actions on July 2nd. My husband's taking this picture. Different points, you'll see people leave things like pennies, flowers, flags, um, hearts. The problem is um, you wanna make sure it's that not, the, the especially on the gravestone, that nothing is being damaged by you leaving coins on it. Um, and who is Andrew Tozier? Well, if you saw the movie Gettysburg, you see that all of a sudden, like just before the battle, like maybe a day or so or two before, he is given command of the second main infantry. Uh, what happens there? Some are trying to um, sign up for three years, some sign up for two years. The ones that sign up for three years are very angry, the two-year men, are free to go. There's hundred something three-year men that feel like they've got a bad deal and now they have to serve out their terms. They are assigned to Chamberlain. He's even told that he could shoot them if they're gonna mutin mutiny. They don't, um, Most maybe three or four uh, refuse to join, but the rest of the second main, he divides them up in different places. And as an ex um, a wonderful historic example, and to get them feel united, Sergeant Andrew Tozier um, joins in. He becomes a color bearer, even though he was with the second main. Chamberlain thought that that would be a good thing to show that he is the color bearer for the regiment. And so he joins with the 20th main being the color bearer. You are under constant fire, the most dangerous, dangerous position to be in. And during the battle, Andrew Tozier is holding the flag firing his weapon. So we have that happening. When does this happen for Joshua Chamberlain and Andrew Tozier on their actions on July 2nd? Can you imagine trying to hold the colors of the 20th Maine, which is the, are the Maltese cross and the color is red. Um, and 
they are, Joshua Chamberlain is awarded his Medal of Honor uh, 30 years later for daring heroism and great tenacity and holding his position on Little Round Top against repeated assaults, which is very true, and carrying the advanced position on the Great Round Top, which is what we call Big Round Top today. Um, Tozier, who at the tech crisis of the engagement, this soldier, a color bearer, stood alone in an advanced position, the regiment having been borne back and defended his colors with musket and ammunition and picked up at his feet, a very precarious position. So there's a the 20th Maine. This is a little ways down and a much deeper position that you can see. Uh, I am gonna go back for a minute because I wanna show you this. Um, this is the monument to the 20th Maine here. And I'm just gonna tell you this story quite briefly. The 20th Maine at Big Round Top, they're done at Little Round Top. Another regiment was commanded to ascend uh, Little Round Top with their troops. There's also gonna be cavalry up there, but that regiment at the time refused. And Chamberlain agreed to go because it's believed that there is Confederate troops and I know they are fired at a few times and I think there's at least one casualty. So they're gonna ascend big round top in the pitch dark and it is so much, much cheaper than little round top. So there's a monument in tribute to them there as well. A lot of people miss this. Oh, the last thing I wanna say is about July 25th, they're gonna begin preliminary work on this area because they've got to redo the parking. This is the place that's so visited. Parking is pretty bad, but the bad news is that there will be no access to Little Round Top. Because, and it is divided by a road, by the way, because uh, there's monuments to other regiments there too, for a year and a half. So if you can get there before then, or if you're gonna go, go a year in the next year and a half, or go to the National Park Service website for Gettysburg to follow the work there. So Chamberlain, by the way, is hit at the battle in two places. I think something bounces off his sword, leaves a, bru a bruise, and then he is um, nicked in the uh, boots also. And you can see that at the Chamberlain Museum where it was patched, so he had blood filling up his boots. He does have uh, wounded six times. This is gonna be the most severe one coming up that I talk about. And he has five horses shot out from under him. August, 1863, Joshua Chamberlain is, and by the way, he does develop malaria after that, goes home briefly. And he's given command of the 3rd Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Corps, but he still has the rank of Colonel. Um, in June 1864, he's been given command of the 1st Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Corps, while still a colonel, I, I told you that. In July, eight, June 18th, he leads the charge at what at the time is believed to be Reeves Salient. And when I talk about a salient, that is a position um, that kind of juts out into en en enemy territory. Um, it is, um, it goes an area of the battlefield, it kind of goes out to point in enemy territory and they are surrounded on three sides. That's what a salient is. Um, and while there, um, he's leading them and he's talking about the charge. When he writes about it, he's talking about going from the uh, area called Fort Hell. This is a very precarious position. Chamberlain actually is ordered to go forward. He says to Grant, I even sends back, he said he could lose his rank for this because he says, I cannot believe the, ge the general doesn't know what we're going into. And, and at the time he's not ordered forward by Grant, but eventually he is ordered forward by someone else in an unsupported position and they're taking uh, fire and he is turned, I'm gonna kind of turn like this, kind of facing behind him uh, to face his man to encourage him to go on. And there's the Maltese cross, um, not exactly 
the same, quite the same as what uh, the 20th Maine had, but you get the idea, the color red, um, the colors of the fifth corps, uh, first division. And he is encouraging his men to go forward at a mini ball, which is got rifling on it. Uh, and it, it kind of expands when it goes into your body. It ricochets off a rock and shatters parts of its pelvis, ripped apart muscle, blood vessels, and went through the bladder before coming to rest just below the skin of his left hip. He managed to stay on his feet and he sticks his saber, jams it into the ground on, and encouraging his men to go on. And so basically it went from hip to hip and did numerous damage until he collapses down on, uh, and it just rests below the skin of the left hip and he collapses eventually down on one knee and side and the other. And he had the brigade colors on the other side of him, he's holding them until his men passed. There he fell bleeding. He was certain he was dying. He, wa he was dying. And the severity of his injuries were such that the Union Army publishes his obituary prematurely. It also appears in the New York Times. And supposedly uh, Grant is going, uh, well, he actually does give him a battlefield promotion, but I believe it was a, a couple of days later um, and he will become a Brigadier General. He, he would survive his injuries after months in the hospital. Uh, for his actions that day, he's promoted on the field to a Brigadier General by Grant, but honestly, I think it was a couple days later. This is um, it's called Soul of the Lion. This is by the artist Joe Umble. You guessed it, I own it. Um, and actually, the uh, what I have has a little Jeff Scott Historical Society. That's uh, um, the place that oversees the Joshua Chamberlain Museum. They, today they're called the Joshua um, Pajep Scott Historic, Pajep Scott History Center, but it has their little symbol on it. I believe he originally uh, commissioned them to do this. And this is me, uh, Reeves Salient, it talks about the action that happened there. What's going to happen later on is that, that where he was at, this sign was actually put here as a parking lot. Um, somebody else that's a doctor that has a, um, an ancestor in the brigade that Chamberlain uh, commanded, I believe, questions that whether he was actually where he thought or if he was a mile away and a different salient. Um, and he and they actually, I believe this was this picture of me was 2014, the first time I'd ever actually seen where I believed he'd been. Um, they did con convince the state of Virginia, because he's in Petersburg, Virginia, to move that sign. Um, there's still people that believe he was that reef salient, people that believe he's, I think it's called Pilgrim Salient. salient. Um, I'm not quite sure, but wherever, or like a mile away, uh, but it's not a part of the battlefield, either place. Um, I hope that I talk about, I'm gonna go back again because I wanna say again, one more thing. Joshua Chamberlain went through literally hell. He just, during this bout, his recovery, he is take, taken off the field, eventually to a field hospital where they probe his wound with a ramrod. ramrod. I want you to think about that how painful that must have been for him. His brother, Tom, who's still with the 20th Maine, I believe he had been promoted maybe to captain by then. Um, and he goes to gets the surgeons from the 20th Maine, Abner Shaw and the one from their sister regiment, the 44th New York, and they will operate on him. His wound is thought to be mortal. Um, he might've had chloroform, but he is conscious a part of the time and they are able to do a surgery that will save his life which was amazing uh, because nine more than 90 percent of abdominal wounds during the civil war 
are deemed to be fatal. He is put on a ship, oh, and that is called the Connecticut. And then he goes to a US General Hospital in Annapolis, where something that is even worse than his wound, believe it or not, happens to him. They insert a metal catheter. You can find, um, I went to Chamberlain days. They used to hold them every other um, summer and they would talk about different topics in Brunswick to do with him swooning. I heard the uh, uh, army surgeon or retired army surgeon, I can't remember which one, uh, talk about th this wound um, and how horrific it was. They insert a metal catheter. I'm talking about the wound he was given by the surgeon at Annapolis and they leave it in there and it develops calcium deposits. And this gives him a wound that becomes an open fistula on the base of his penis through which urine can leak. He will battle this for the rest of his life. He has numerous surgeries. He's in excruciating pain and he certainly could have been discharged. He will come back, uh, but he's not quite well enough, but then he will eventually come back for the end of the war. He goes through hell, but he does come back. And to be, I'm trying to talk about this delicately. I don't think he was ever able to have a normal physical relationship with his wife after this. And that is the result of that metal catheter, which was caused by, you know, of course, being shot during battle. And he wants to make sure, by the way, that his mother knows that he wasn't retreating, that he was not a coward, that he's turned this way to encourage his men, which he certainly was. So he does come back at the end of the war and he's the commanding um, uh, the first division of Warren's. Governor Warren, remember him from the Battle of Gettysburg, Fifth Corps, when they were attacked by three uh, Confederate brigades. And this battle, the Battle of Quaker Road, it's also got several other names, um, is considered the opening battle of the Appomattox campaign. This was the first in a series of attempts by Grant's army to cut Lee's final supply line, the South Side Railroad in spring 1865. And here, Union forces led by Brigadier General Joshua Chamberlain engaged Confederates under Major General Bushrod R. Johnson after sharp fighting the Union troops entrenched nearby along the Boy Boynton Plank Road and Johnson withdrew to his lines at White Oak Road the Union Army cut the rail line four days later after capturing five forks on the 1st of April from the Department of Historic Resources in Virginia. And very active, many engagements at the end of the war. On March 29, 1865, at the Battle of Quaker Road, AKA Lewis's Farm Road, or a gravelly run, a mini ball, again, does such damage. It goes through his horse's neck, tore through his left arm, is smashed into his chest below, just below, beneath the heart, a packet of uh, field orders and a bat, brass back mirror, ripped through the seam of his coat. It goes through, it spun around his torso, goes out the back of his coat, seam of his coat and knocked the aide are riding next to him out of his saddle. Chamberlain is temporarily unconscious. So think about it. It goes through his horse's neck, goes through here, um, spins around, goes through the back, back and out, the seam of his uh, jacket and Tam Chamberlain is unconscious. His aide is knocked from his uh, saddle and General Griffin, his commanding officer, rides up and says something like, my dear general, you are God. I mean, he was pretty injured here. And Chamberlain's story is that he becomes conscious. And he says, after the general says, my dear general, you are God. And he says, 
Yes, I am. And then, uh, he, he meant you're gone, dead. Chamberlain means I'm gone, taking off. And uh, he he had the, the wound in the left arm and the chest and was nearly captured. He ends up in the enemy lines. And some of this I'm remembering from my um, brain here. So excuse me for not being as eloquent as I should be. And J Chamberlain, professor of modern, um, languages at Bowen College can pretend to be a Southerner and he's in, in a faded gray uniform. And he realizes he's mixed up in the enemy lines and they, they he kind of pretends that he's one of them, leads them into the arms of Union troops where they surrender because he puts on a Southern accent. So he makes it through there and uh, for his actions at the end of the war, uh, he is gets a brevet an honorary promotion to major general. Um, and I have a, um, this is Chamberlain at the end of the war, because you know that uh, Lee and Grant work out the formal terms of the surrender. Surrender, I sounded my like my New England self there. Um, but Chamberlain receives the surrender of the Confederate troops on April 12th, 1865. They are to have a formal surrender ceremony. And Chamberlain will have his current brigade and his past brigade there with him um, receiving this. During the war's final chapter at Appomattox, Chamberlain was selected to receive the Confederate surrender of arms. He ordered his men to stand at attention as the Confederates passed as a sign of respect. I'm gonna elaborate on that. I've been talking way too long here again, um, but this is what is happening. They have to lay down their battle arms and their flags in a formal surrender ceremony. They are allowed to keep their personal side arms Chamberlain does not salute like this kind of salute. It's called the old Carrie Amor standing at attention to welcome these soldiers back to the Union. And um, I have met a lot of people that from the South that are not friends of the uh, what happened, but they do have the greatest respect for Chamberlain. This is John. Gordon leading the surrender um, for the Confederates. And so I had tried to, I'm kind of covering up here. Oh, I'm gonna go back a little bit. I kind of covered up. It was not a present arms as, which now is then was the highest or to be paid, paid even to a president. It was the carry arms as it was then known with musket held by the right hand and perpendicular to the shoulder. I may best describe it as a marching salute. This is Chamberlain writing. When General Gordon came opposite me, I had the bugle blown and the entire line came to attention preparatory to executing this movement manual successively and by regiments as Gordon's columns should pass before our front each in turn. The general was riding in advance of his troops, his chin dropped to his breast, downhearted and dejected in appearance be almost beyond description. At the sound of that machine-like snap of arms, however, and you can see how they're standing. He wheeled his horse facing me, touching him gently with his spur so that the animal reared, slightly reared. And as he wheeled, horse and rider made one motion the horse's head swung down with a graceful bow and General Gordon dropped his sword, point to his toe in salutation, returning basically that gesture. And that is called the last salute. There's another one called honor, answering honor. Uh, one of the things also uh, question has been, did this really happen? Some people don't believe it did, uh, but 
I did go many years ago to Appomattox. I've been there three times. And I spoke to the historian, I believe his name was Ron Wilson. Um, and he said there, were, there are numerous accounts from soldiers that were there verifying that this action happened. Um, other people, uh, he was chosen, it happened. Everything today is subject, and we should always dig and dig deeper, but sometimes it's subject to uh, the lens of what we a person believes. In fact, me be honest, everybody views history from their own lens, including those first person accounts um, as, what to as to what happened there. And this is what happened. He received the Confederate surrender. Could Chamberlain have, uh, so that happens. And a few days later, and then I'll talk a little more, May 23rd, 1865, the Grand Review, a two-day uh, parade for the new president. Lincoln has been assassinated for the new president, Johnson. Johnson And Chamberlain is there participating in the Grand Review on the first day, uh, leading, the command, leading as the commander of the first uh, division of the Fifth Corps. And there's Joshua Chamberlain on his horse, Charlemagne. And this is called the proffered wreath, by the way. And General Chamberlain's horse shies away from the offering of a victory leap wreath because now everyone has surrendered. Uh, the war is over. This is wrapping up. This young woman runs out in the crowd. It's horse Charlemagne. He named him. He was a professor. That's where he gets that name from. The horse is startled, and Chamberlain uh, is not able to accept that victory wreath. But he does lead this parade in and there's the victory offering and this take place in Washington DC. Joshua Chamberlain uh, could have stayed in the ar army. Um, he was offered a position. He was not interested in a peacetime army. And so he'll go on to something else. Um, and very briefly, how does this even connect to Thomas Edison? Because most of my history is going to connect to Edison, Ford, Florida. Um, it was a bit of a stretch. I asked permission to talk about this because I did volunteer for nine years. I would drive 90 miles to tell his story, one of the greatest honors of my life. Um, but Joshua Chamberlain is a grown man. He is born in eight. 1828. Thomas Edison is born in 1847, so he's a teenager. Two connections. He is a telegraph operator, which was they were used heavily during the Civil War, um, not actually part of the Union troops, however. He also um, uh, would sell newspapers when he was younger. Battle of Shiloh, which Chamberlain is an at, but a major battle during the Civil War in 1862. And he realizes what's happening. And he convinces somebody to sell him these uh, newspapers on um, account, advance them. And he sells numerous newspapers telling the story of the Battle of Shiloh. He's a savvy businessman. A uh, very vague connection there, but it does happen. Um, so Edison sells newspapers talking about a battle. The third thing that happens is that um, he becomes friends with an artist and a sculptor, uh, Thomas Edison does, known as John Kelly. And he's uh, drawing about the, actually the a Revolutionary War battle that Molly Pitcher is in. And he's writing, um, there's a, what they call a bas relief or a bar relief of that battle. And Matt, uh, Molly Pitcher is there um, as a female in battle. But also there is Thomas Edison. Now he didn't take part in the Revolutionary War, but he became good friends with this artist and sculptor, uh, John Kelly, who sculpts Thomas Edison, a clean shaven man. And he couldn't find anybody and he has Thomas Edison there um, sculpting, drawing him, his very good friend. He knows him from Menlo Park, New Jersey, where Edison was. And then he becomes friends later on with Joshua Chamberlain and interviews him. So he talks with Kelly 
talks about his friendship with Edison, though he wasn't in the battle. He's just used as a model. He talks about his greatness as an inventor. And then he interviews, John Kelly interviews Joshua Chamberlain. There's a bar relief of him in his home in uh, Brunswick, Maine. And so their two stories uh, meet up through this artist and sculptor, John Kelly. And I am running out of time. Here's Chamberlain, he's in 24 battles. He gives a small teeth cross uh, bracelet to his wife, 24 engagements of, um, and, the cel and their um, hourglasses um, signifying the hours that he was away from his wife, Fanny, um, gives it to her for his 10th wedding anniversary. So each rep represents an engagement like Antietam, he's not in the battle, they're held in the reserve but he is there and then all the other engagements that he goes through and there's a diamond in there. And this is in the special collections, a section of Bowdoin College where they also have numerous letters that he's written, including to his mother, to his wife. And by the way, he writes a beautiful letter to his wife, Fanny, as he thinks he's dying. Remember I told you he thinks he's dying um, at the battle at Reef Salient at Petersburg. And he writes a letter such as, my darling wife, Fanny, I'm trying to remember this. I'm lying here mortally wounded, the doctors think. Jesus Christ is my all sufficient savior. I go to him, God bless and keep you my precious wife. You've been a precious wife to me. And then he writes about his children um, and it goes on from there, but it's very moving because everyone thinks he's dying. This is handwritten on and I didn't get the exact words right and it goes on, but in a very shaky pencil hand there. But I encourage you to visit the special collection section of the Bowdoin College Library. They have things out there. They have this, they have um, some other exciting things as well. And I had the honor of having my son find a letter from Chamberlain and where it was attached to a board. He had to pay to get it conserved get removed from there and, and you kind of can read it today. Um, it's in his hand and it's given in remember of me uh, to Bowdoin College because of my passion for, for um, Joshua Chamberlain. And so there's a Jeff Scott Historic, Historical Society, Jeff Scott History Center that oversees his home and two others. And they have numerous things to do with Chamberlain. There's the Joshua Chamberlain Museum. There's Bowdoin College across the street that has a large repository of things to do with Chamberlain. And Chamberlain uh, was awarded this Medal of Honor 30 years after the Battle of Gettysburg. And nobody ever knew that there were two Medal of Honors. Um, his heroics at the Battle of Gettysburg. And then there's this one he's um, given many years later that was allowed that you could keep both as long as they were never worn at the same time. So Bowdoin College owns and has the second, you, this on display, you used to have to have them bring it out. And then somebody, Chamberlain's granddaughter had given numerous things from Chamberlain that she had of Chamberlain's to church rummage sales and stuff. And somehow this ends up in a box or in a book, it was purchased in the, it was in the back of a book at a book sale at a church where his granddaughter left her estate. It was found, this gentleman donated it anonymously. So the Joshua Chamberlain Museum, which I've never gotten to see that, uh, donated that, that was donated to them and you can see it there. Then you can go across the street and see the replacement I think that was given in the early, in 19, around 1904. Um, he actually doesn't get a big ceremony. He gets this in the mail in 1893. We never knew that there, there were two. Now there's this one that comes out in 1904 and that's why there's two Medal of Honors and that's the highest honor that a soldier can be given. He returns briefly to Bowdoin but he's soon elected four terms as governor of Maine, one year terms, can you imagine that? I always feel he looks like he has aged a great deal here. I think a career in politics, of course, he's been through a lot in the war, is also very stressful. Um, he's gonna go on to establish the um, new agricultural and technical college, the University of Maine at, at Orono. Um, 
and he, there is a his desk as governor of Maine, a chair that was brought out for the carnival and winter home, the winter homecoming queens and carnival queens. He does things like persuade Scandinavian immigrants to take up farming in Northern Maine, including a place called New Sweden and to immigrate in Northern Maine, it's much colder. I have my own theory about what happens to Maine after the war. You hit roughly 10% of soldiers from each day go. New Hampshire has 30,000 something, Maine has 70 something thousand. Today they have close to identical populations. Um, people left the Maine in droves after the war trying to find opportunity. Um, and he will commute back and forth to a hotel in, in Augusta, the Capitol. They didn't have a Capitol building. I mean, a governor's mansion then. He would come back to his home in Maine and he would take the train back and forth um, just around the corner on Potter Street from where Chamberlain had his home moved as Governor Maine. Uh, the, the, their current Governor Maine lived there for a long time in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And his uh, name is Angus King. He's now Senator for Maine. Um, when Joshua Chamberlain becomes president of the college, he doesn't wanna move, excuse me. Um, I'm gonna go back for a minute. No, I'll just keep on going for it and I'll talk about it later. But he doesn't want to move into the um, president's quarters. So he's going to have his home modified, lifted 11 feet into the air, the first floor put underneath. And so instead of like a two story cape, it's like a three story or a two and a half, two and three quarters story cape. Um, not even a cape, it's a totally different home now. That did happen to a few homes, so it wasn't totally unusual to have that happen. These are uh, certificates of recognition for all the men from Maine. It, they were steel engraved, signed by him as governor of the Maine of Maine. They have one at the Chamberlain Museum that's actually made out to himself, signed by himself as the governor of Maine. In 1876, he's elected um, to the major general of state militia. And there was a mob scene in Augusta challenging um, the outcome of the gubernatorial race. Um, let me just say it was very dramatic. The Republicans and Democrats were fighting over the outcome of the race. I believe it's Democrats that are challenging it. There's threats of violence. He's there. Supposedly there's a moment when he throws open his coat and says, shoot me if you must. I believe this goes on for four days and it's resolved peacefully. But I'm gonna guarantee you that they were, that during the, what happens at the Capitol many years later um, in 2021, they uh, inquired about this uh, from people that worked at the Chamberlain Museum. He goes on to do things like writes many speeches. Um, he's very much a public figure, talks about his war experience, writes about them. Uh, he also invested in a hotel in Florida and Orange Groves, I believe in Ocala. Complete flop then, maybe he was ahead of his time. It's not successful. Not the best businessman, I'm gonna be honest there. Um, they always struggle for money. He's um, very, in 1889, he's at the dedication of the 20th Maine Monument that I showed you, there he is right there with other people from the 20th Maine where he says, in great deeds, something abides in great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass, bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate the ground for the vision place of souls, generations that know us not and that we know not of heart drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done for them shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream and lo, the shadow of a mighty presence shall wrap them in its bosom and the power of the vision pass into their souls. And I think that beautiful, very Victorian era language He, and that's the only book he's ever going to write. It's called The Passing of the Armies. It's, um, at the end of the war, uh, he, that speech was written, and that's compiled in a book 
of speeches and talks and writings called Bayonets Ford. Bayonet Ford, excuse me, in 1867, they moved their home from Potter Street to Main Street, just those few feet. Maltese Cross is added to the center chimney. And then he's appointed, appointed um, president of Bowdoin College, as I tell you, it's lifted. It gave some room to entertain. And from 1871 to 1883, he's the president of Bowdoin College. Um, he institutes military drill. That wasn't very popular. Uh, he does do some good things there. Um, add summer courses for women. Women aren't admitted on a full-time basis till 1971. Um, he entertains students at his home and he entertains some of the most important people of the time. Um, it wasn't easy being president of um, Bowdoin College. He adds modern languages, by the way. And some of the people that he entertains at his home, German, Generals Grant, Sheridan, Sherman, and McClellan, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who had lived in a few rooms of that home, comes back and visits Chamberlain, said, with the tears in his eyes, it's almost, you know, the best hours of his life were set there, spent there with his first wife. He lost two wives. Um, and Helen Keller, as well as some main politicians of the time. There he is later as a trustee with the other general from Maine, known as the Christian General Oliver Otis Howard was also at the Battle of Gettysburg, command of the field for um, the time. Uh, well, it goes back and forth between him and General Hancock on uh, day one, but there they are. They both graduated Bowdoin. He is also a trustee um, of Bowdoin College after, he's, after he resigns his post because his health is still so bad. Um, later years, he is, um, well, let me talk about this. This is me being goofy. Um, I never had, um, this was built a few years after I started volunteering at the Chamberlain Museum. Um, it's a, this was, they hired a sculpture, Joseph Wary, I believe. And it is a nice of him in later years. And it's a great statue, it's about eight feet tall. Gosh, I think it's even, it's, but it's on a pedestal, quite a high pedestal. Um, and it was not without controversy. It's between Bowdoin College and the home, like in a median. Um, students used to do some interesting things to it. That's me visiting. I visit, I've visited one time since I left in 2005. Um, and I had my picture taken there, so I'm being a goof. Um, but it's across the, uh, I hope you'll go visit there and you'll get to see the statue. And by the way, it's a great little museum. I encourage you to go. There's so much to see. There's numerous buildings that were there when he was president of Bowdoin. There's a cemetery down the road. There's a home, there's a sculpture. Um, and he's appointed surveyor of customs of the Port of Portland. He actually wants a different position, a little more prestigious position but it's a political uh, thing and he doesn't get it. He needs the money. Um, he didn't have to be down there on the waterfront, but he would be there working. And he's also elected department commander of the Grand Army of the Republic. Fanny dies in 1905 and 1909, he purchases an additional home, 499 Ocean Avenue. He writes passing of the armies that comes out after his death. He dies at his home in Portland, the last person to die from his wounds, there's his Medal of Honor marker. His wife Fanny's says unveiled because she had lost her vision, I'm guessing, or could have a spiritual connection. His grave, people leave numerous things here. Go visit it. He's given a large funeral in Portland and then one where his body is taken by train to Brunswick, Maine. You can visit it. You can walk down the street and go see it. Go visit him. I have numerous sources. If you want them, I'll send them to you. Um, Joshua Chamberlain is one of the um, great, great men and a hero in my eyes. And let me just check your couple of things here. I'm going to run out of time. I talked too long. Was Harriet Beecher Stowe family ever at Phillips, Exeter, Andover? When I worked there, I think I remember hearing that. And yes, she certainly was there. They were there and there, uh, I believe that that is where her husband is buried. Um, and perhaps I can't remember if she is, but
but I think she might be as well. So yes, they were there. They were only in Brunswick for two years. Um, and the chat questions, um, this is so, that is so beautiful. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. This is a passion. Civil War, go visit those battlefields. Come visit us here, um, here at Edison Ford Winter States and go visit Brunswick, Maine and go visit Chamberlain. It's usually open from um, the end of May until like the middle of October. And I thanks for th sharing. Thank you for your comments. Um, it's an honor to do this. And next month, next month, what am I doing? I am talking up in there I'm about the Lindberghs of Southwest Florida on August 16th at 10.30. If you have a question, you want uh, anything, H. Schaefer at edisonford.org. We're at 2350 McGregor Boulevard. And you can email me um, at any time with any questions. This will be on YouTube um, in tomorrow. Thank you for joining me. Um, I appreciate your comments. This is um, the greatest honor, as I said, in my life. One of them was getting to be there. Thank you. I'll see you next month. Goodbye. And thank you for your kind comments.